Okay, now, what's the uncertainty? Very, very little uncertainty. Now you use your intent to modify a probable future, which is dying of this cancer. It's a lot harder because there's a lot less uncertainty. All right. Um, so there's not so much wiggle room anymore. So does that mean you should never go to a doctor? Of course not. <laughs> what it means is that if you want to modify something, you ought to start working on it while the outcome is still very uncertain. That's what it means. Okay. Before, it become, before your wiggle room is squeezed out, that's when you need to work on it. Because if you don't go to, if you don't go to that doctor, of course, that, it's the rule set, you know, genetics, probability, uh, uh, biology, physics, going on on your neck there. That's just going to happen. That's just the way the rule set is. It says that there's something there creates that problem. It's going to probably create that problem unless the rule set says it goes away. Most likely it's just going to keep going. So to ignore it is foolish. You ought to start working on those things, though, before it becomes a crisis. Like everything else in your life, it's always easier to work on something before it, you know, before it becomes a crisis, right? Preventive medicine is better than medicine after the fact. So that's, the, that's kind of the lesson there. Sure, if you don't go to the doctor, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be whatever the rule set says it's going to be. And that may be a good idea to get the doctor to cut that out, literally. But um, that's what we're talking about. Now, what about the doctor who has a negative attitude? What about a doctor who takes one look at it and he goes, oh, yeah, that's, that's cancer. You're going you're gonna to die. And he thinks, oh, this, you know, this lump is, is awful. I know this is cancer. No, he hasn't, gotten to buy it. he hasn't gotten it back yet. It's still uncertain. But this is his attitude. What's he doing? He's biasing the probable future for that lump to be cancerous. You see? Okay, and uh, so the pessimistic doctor will have a higher percentage of cancerous tumors among his patients than the optimistic doctor. Because the optimistic doctor who says, well, we don't know yet, you know, it's hard to say. Let's not jump to any conclusions. I think it might just be, you know, fibrous, uh, you know, something or other. He is biasing the probable future to be benign. So what kind of doctor would you rather go to, an optimistic one or a pessimistic one? You see, well, these, these kinds of things have been studied. It's a matter of fact that doctors with good bedside manner have healthier patients, have a higher, you know, have a lower percentage, you know, assuming their patients are similar, studies that have been done. Why is that? Because that good bedside manner keeps themselves and their patients encouraged and positive, biasing the future to a more positive outcome. Okay, this happens all sorts of things. We've had studies that show that if you tell a teacher that her school children in her class are all geniuses, they will end up making higher scores on standardized tests. If you tell that same teacher that her students are all the slow group and really, are gonna, you know, really don't understand anything, those kids will make lower scores on standardized tests. And the only thing you've done different is tell the teacher, give the teacher an expectation. Now, you give the teacher the expectation and you give the kids an expectation. You not only tell the teacher that all those kids aren't too bright, you tell the, the, I mean, you tell the teacher that. You also tell the kids that. The kids, you're not too bright. You know, this is a slow group. Teacher, this is a slow group. Do the best you can. You'll find that they'll do much worse later on. And they've done these tests where they've taken children and just randomly sorted them. You know, so you have out of thousands and thousands of children, they're just randomly sorted. And then they, they make these different statements and they found that these expectations make a big difference in the outcome. Well, again, this is soft science, right? This isn't the hard science of how heavy is the rock. This is soft science, it has to do with people. The only way we can do experiments in science with people is double blind, triple blind. We can't have the teachers thinking that this is a, you know, a dumb group or the kids thinking that they're the dumb kids because it'll actually make that happen. It'll create that expectation. So this is turned up in all manner of, of uh, things besides you know, education and medicine. The placebo effect, right? We mentioned that already, placebo effect, very well known. Actually, the placebo effect was first discovered by a nurse in 
I don't know whether it was World War I or II, probably World War I, I don't know, but the, in the field hospital, they ran out of morphine. Well, they had people there with limbs torn off and all kinds of terrible wounds, like you might expect in a, in a field hospital, and they didn't have any more painkiller. This nurse just did not have the heart to tell these guys, sorry, you're just going to have to lie there and suffer in your pain because we don't have any more morphine. So she just gave them saline solution and told them it was morphine. And she was shocked to find out that 30 or 40 percent of them felt much better. The pain went away. Thank you, nurse. You know, they felt a lot better. And that was the first sense of the placebo effect. And after that, it was studied and studied and studied and found out that it's a very, very real effect. And we're not talking about people who just think they're better. We're talking about people who really get better. So you hand out, you know, a benign pill, just cellulose, you know, nothing in it but cellulose. And you hand out that pill to people and you tell them, this is a new discovery on science. This is a great pill. It's going to make your liver work better. Somebody that has a liver problem. And you will find that if you do that, about 35% of those people, their liver will improve. Whereas in the control group, you know, same group, randomly, same problems, randomly put apart, pulled apart, you find that the control group, their liver doesn't get better. So why is that? Mind affecting matter, right? Okay, well that's the, it's the same thing. That placebo effect is the person having a positive attitude toward that illness changes what happens, changes the probability, okay? Um, Let's see. Okay. Oh, one more. Oh, we're way ahead of things here. Synchronicity. All right. Now, let's talk about synchronicity. All right, the, the system computes the probability of what happens next according to the rule set and according to history. Right, so we're going to have two rules. We can't violate the rule set. Okay, and the other rule is we need a consistent history. And those are rules on this, on this reality of ours because that's what makes our reality livable and gives us good feedback and makes the best learning, learning lab for us to be in. Okay, well, where you have uncertainty then, you enable multiple solutions. We've already talked about that. Where there's uncertainty, you can get three or four or five different things might work just fine within that uncertainty. So all those things are possible. And when you make the measurement, you pick one out at, at random. Okay, so that means synchronicity becomes, prob becomes possible. Because now, here we are in a system. We are the working fluid. You know, we're, we're what's helping this system evolve by our own evolution. We're just a piece of this system experiencing this virtual reality so that we can become love. We can grow up. We can reduce the entropy of ourselves and thus the system. So the system really wants us to succeed. It's not that the system really doesn't care. You're on your own. You know, do what you do. The system really wants us to succeed because our success is its success. It grows when we grow. We're it. It's us. Okay, so synchronicity, just like a guide, like the guides bubbled up out of the system to help you grow, help give you some answers and encouragement and a little boosts where you need it, help you get through the hard spots, well, so does synchronicity. Just bubble up out of the system, gets applied to you to help you grow, to help you get through the hard spots, to give you some encouragement. That's what synchronicity does. It becomes possible. So a weak history gives the system fewer constraints. Okay, so where you have a weak history, where you don't know then you have more uncertainty, you have fewer constraints. Okay, and we have a bunch of, uh, bunch of uh, examples here. One of them, uh, let's see, I have a list of them here. One of them is your car keys. You know, you, uh, you can't find your car keys. You don't know where they are. Or you left your car keys on your desk and you go back and they're not there. There's uncertainty in the system. You're not sure where you left your car keys. Your car keys could have been left, you know, in the kitchen or some other place, not on your desk. So when you go back to find those car keys and you look for them, they don't necessarily have to be where you left them. They could be in the kitchen. 
because that's sort of probable too. You might have left them there, and you don't really remember where you left them. So when you reach up and make that measurement and look for it, you might find them on your desk. You might not, you see? So sometimes things just aren't where they're supposed to be, and you don't know why, and you think for sure they should be there, but they're not. I mean, everybody's had these kinds of experiences before. That's because it's a probabilistic system, and things don't have to stay where you put them. Just like that dead tree didn't have to be a dead tree when the next guy walked into the woods because it could have been something else. You see, it's the kind of reality we, we live in. Things don't always have to be the way we think they are. Okay, um, you know, here's, uh, I have grand, Grandma's Ring written down there. This is a situation where the, the larger consciousness system is conspiring to teach you a lesson, help you grow help you reduce your entropy because that helps the system. So grandma dies and she has one thing that's very valuable that all of her children want and that's this big expensive diamond ring that she's had. It's been in the family for generations. Didn't cost much originally but by now it's worth a small fortune, right? So grandma dies and everybody kind of liked to have that ring. Well the children go to the, to the house and everybody's looking for the ring. Where's that ring? That's the most valuable thing Grandma owns, and nobody can find it. It's just gone. Well, what happens? Each of the children think one of the other ones got it. That's what happens. They get angry with each other. They get mad with each other. They accuse each other. They have all this problem, all this fear, all this greed, all this ego. And then a week later, they're there, and one of them says, Oh, here it is. It's sitting right up here on the shelf. There's grandma's ring. Oh, well, now they think that whoever stole it felt bad and put it back. <laughs> See, But the lesson there that the system is giving them is don't jump to conclusions. Don't start accusing people. Don't see it, you know, don't work out of your ego. That's the lesson. And what they did, of course, was very painful and very hurtful for all of them. And it'll take them a while to grow out of it. That's a strong lesson. But that's a lesson that the larger conscious system will do. Something will just disappear and then it reappears in an obvious spot that you, know, could have, uh, that you couldn't have overlooked. Couldn't have been there all the time. Yet nobody knows why or how it got that way. That's because you do not live in an objective reality. See, we just keep thinking that we're crazy, right? We have bad memories. Gee, I must have overlooked that doesn't have to be that way. We keep making excuses because we believe in an objective reality. Um, here's one that I'm, I'm fond of. It's the uh, beer in the refrigerator story. You get back from a long trip and you look in your refrigerator for a beer because airplanes always dehydrate you and make you thirsty. So you walk into your apartment, you open up the refrigerator and you know, there's no beer in the refrigerator. Yet you remember that there was at least two or three or four or five, something like that. You remember you left some there, but there's none. Okay, how can that happen? You've had things like that where you knew something was supposed to be some way and it wasn't. Well, this is, can be part of a synchronicity. So let's say that uh, when you took this trip, just before you left, you opened the refrigerator door, you tucked your camera, and you took a picture of what was inside the refrigerator, and there was exactly four beer in the refrigerator. Now you come back a week later, how many is going to be there? Four, right? Because now you have the data. You've made the measurement, and you've got the data, and it's in the reality. Now you're, you have that function. Remember, we have that upper graph where it just goes straight up and straight down. That's the kind of graph you have. The data is here. It's always going to be four, unless somebody actually is sneaking in your house and taking your beer. It's going to stay four. But most people don't take pictures in their refrigerator, you know, of the insides of the refrigerator before they leave. And most people's memories just aren't that perfect. And you really don't know how many's in there. And within that uncertainty, you can get any kind of answer that falls within the natural uncertainty. You're not likely to come back and find three cases of beer in your refrigerator because that's not in the natural uncertainty. But if you had two or three or something like that, you might find zero. That could be that you were just wrong, you know, that you just thought there was some there and they weren't. So how does the system use that? Well, the system, you see, can bias that result. The system can say, all right, let's make it zero. And at the same time, let's give that, that entity a, a suggestion about how parched and thirsty they are and how much they really need a beer. 
So you get both of those. You really need a beer and you open your refrigerator and there are none. So what do you do? You go to the store. You get in your car and you go to the store. And while you're at the store, you just happen to bump into somebody who changes your life. Right? You find your soulmate. Uh, somebody offers you a job. Just you know, Yours just got canceled last week. Something happens and you go, wow, what synchronicity. I just ran out of beer. I went to the store. I just ran into this guy. Well, that's because the system can manipulate that within the natural uncertainty. The system wants you to succeed. Once you get out of living a left brain life and get into a whole brain life or even a right brain life, you'll find that your whole existence goes that way. You just live that way. You don't necessarily plan or, or uh, you know, control anything and it all just happens. It just happens for you whenever you need it. When you need a connection, a connection materializes. When you need a guide, a guide materializes. When you need a little bit of money, it's just some comes by. You know, it just, it just works that way. Uh, if you don't try to control it. Okay, so these are, um, I think I can go to the next one. So here's the picture of that. Here's where you take the picture of the beer in the refrigerator. So there's always going to be, let's say F is four, there's always going to be four beer in the refrigerator because that's, the, that's where the probability is and you reach in there and grab a random number, it's just going to be four because it's a, that's all that's in the, that's all that's in the box is fours. Now, what about here? Okay, if we look at that, the, the uh, red curve here is just after you left. Okay, let's say you remember four like that, but you didn't take the picture. But this is kind of, after you left, it looks like that. F is four. You kind of think pretty much it's four, but eh, it could be five or it could be you know, three, you don't know for sure, but you don't think it was, you know, you don't think it was 10 and you don't think it was one or none. But that's, that's just after you left. Now, what about after you've been gone for two weeks and you come back two weeks later, now your memory's even foggier. And let's say this is now your probability curve two weeks later. You really don't think it would be a whole lot, but you know it could be. You think it's somewhere in about here, but now you see you've got, your curve is, is, has broadened out because you've got more uncertainty in it. So now the range of possibilities, when you reach up and open that refrigerator door and make the measurement, could be a, a lot of different things. So now it looks like you could draw none here, where we get the none, I guess, is A. You could draw out a none if you had this curve, this dotted curve, is the probability that the larger consciousness system gives you. This is the one that you had, that's what you thought. But you see, it gives you something that's within the uncertainty of what you thought. So you see the point? The, the synchronicity happens within the natural uncertainty of the problem. If you knew for sure, then the larger conscious system couldn't use this for synchronicity. But it can in this case because its choice for you is down here someplace. See, if that's four, right, if F is four and that's three and that's two and that's one and that's zero, well, yeah, zero is possible. You could draw that zero out. It's actually pretty probable. So that's, that's uh, the way that works. I should go back one more then. And, uh, so sometimes we're just saying that synchronicity is possible, okay? Sometimes what seems like synchronicity may just be circumstance and it might just be coincidence. Sometimes not. However, it's logical that the system would be designed to support your, your evolutionary process in general, our evolution's its evolution, which leads to an evolving, self-optimizing -op larger consciousness system actively supporting your personal evolution. Synchronicity is the result of the larger consciousness system evolving processes to help it lower its entropy, its system entropy. Okay, we have lots of experiences of this sort of thing. Um, we have paranormal, not only synchronicity experiences, but paranormal experiences. And most of them are just there to open your eyes, to, to tell you, hey, Reality is larger than you think. 
is a bigger picture than you think. It's not just about the stuff. There's a spiritual dimension. There's a mental dimension. Um, you, know, you can have uh, synchronicity. You may be pushing your grocery cart down the aisle and a, and a little uh, thing of aspirin you know, falls off a shelf and rolls in front of your cart. And you go, oh, yeah, see, you know, I, we don't have any of that. We should take one of those. So you put it in your cart and you go and you buy it. And that's maybe a Saturday evening. And then to, the next day on a Sunday, you have a terrible headache. And, boy, it's a good thing you bought that, that aspirin because all the stores are closed now and I couldn't get any. Okay, so, and you think about that and say, boy, that was good luck. That, that medicine almost jumped out in front of me like a book almost jumps off the shelf into your hand when you're walking, when it's a book that really makes a difference to you. And you say, well, you know, was my headache that important that the larger consciousness system wanted to make sure I had some aspirin when I got my headache? Of course not. That's not the point. The larger consciousness system isn't really interested in your headache so much as it is in opening your eyes, saying, something happened here. That was really strange. The more strange experiences you have, the more open your mind is to reality actually being strange, which it is. You see, it's a mind opener. So we have, uh, you know, deja vu, uh, precognitive dreams, a telepathy experiment. How many mothers have just had the knowing that their child was hurt? You know, it happens a lot, right? That's telepathy. They just know it. It's intuition. Well, that gives them a sense of a larger reality. Prayers being answered. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you will get a voice of a dead relative, you know, come over to telephone or be on your answering machine or something like that, and it'll have data that, that uh, lets you know that that was them. Well, how does that happen? How does that dead guy talk on a telephone and leave a message on your answering machine? Obviously, he doesn't do it in an objective reality. So it's just the larger consciousness system taking an opportunity within the uncertainty that's natural to the situation to open your eyes a little bit, nudge you in a direction of seeing a larger reality because that nudges you in a direction of seeking bigger pictures which will take you to lowering your entropy, growing up, becoming love, and getting rid of your ego and fear. That's where that leads. Okay, for the most part, these kinds of paranormal experiences are not about the information delivered. They're about giving you a personal experience to pry open your mind. You know, I had a, an engineer friend of mine who thought anything paranormal was ridiculous until one, one uh, night he had a precognitive dream and he, he was in an airplane. He was very familiar with airplanes and he knew the make and the model and so on just by looking at it. And while he was in this airplane, he saw all the people in it. And he said he saw them in a lot of detail. I mean, he saw them just like he was there. And all of them were in black and white. And this one little girl sitting in the middle row was in color. So he was there for a little while, and he looked. Then the next day, or it was a couple of days later, an airplane crashed. Killed everybody on board except one little girl. It was the exact same make and model of airplane that he saw when he was there. So suddenly, this engineer who said, all oh, this stuff is a bunch of crap, all those people believe it are crazy, he said, whoa, you know, this is very strange. You know, my reality must be bigger than what I thought it was. It opened his mind. He started on a, on a, a search for a bigger reality and a truth, and it changed his whole life. Well, why did he get that precognitive dream? It wasn't about the airplane or the little girl. It was about him. It was about opening a door in his mind. And a lot of your paranormal experiences are going to be just that. It's not the message that's important, it's your experience. It's your personal experience with it is what's really important. Now some mistakenly think that synchronicity implies a scripted life, that there's no free will. You know, it's just a script. We, just, we have a deterministic reality and the aspirin rolls out in front of us because we need it, because that's in the script. It's not so. They're just targets of opportunity that are exploited by a system with a purpose. That's why you get synchronicity. And synchronicity is possible because we live in a probabilistic system and they have uncertainty. We have uncertainty in the system, and that uncertainty allows for a multitude of solutions. So it can pick a solution that just happens to make you go to the store looking for more beer, where you bump into this person who just happened to go there for some other reason. That's how synchronicity works. All right. Now we're going to get to 
the false appearance of backward causality. This one's also kind of fun. Um, I first ran into backward causality the, the, that, it, that it existed by a, a patient study that was done in Israel by a bunch of rabbis who took patient records, prayed for the patients to have good health. Now these were records, you know, these people had been out of the hospital for a decade. These were 10 year old, 15 year old records from the hospital. They prayed for the people, a certain group of people, they split, you know, again, this is science, right? So you do a random, a random sort, you pray for this group, you don't pay for that group. Then for the group that you prayed for, they found out that they had on the average shorter hospital stays. And they said, my God, we've, we've changed the past. These are old records. How can we pray for these people to have good health and they have better health than the control group? And the experiment was done over and over enough times that they realized they were actually having a, you know, an effect. It was a statistically significant effect that they were improving the health of people who had already been out of the hospital for a decade. That was then termed reverse causality. They were causing something to, hap you know, to unhappen, if you will, in the past. Well, it doesn't work like that. There's no such thing as backward causality. You can't have a, th you know, a thing cause itself and the cause has to precede the event. Uh, then later I ran into the same thing done more technically. And that was with a Geiger counter. Geiger counter will make a beep when, or make a pulse when a, 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 a particle goes through it. You know, when a radiation, radiation particle. So you have a, de a source, a radioactive source, and it decays and it throws out particles. And when one of these particles hits a Geiger counter, the Geiger counter makes a, a pulse. So what they did is they took two Geiger counters and put them on equal sides of a radioactive source. A radioactive source will always radiate randomly in any direction. In an objective world, both Geiger counters would in time get the same number of counts. Okay, and if you, each one only got 10 counts, then they could be pretty different. But if each one has 300,000 counts, then they ought to be really, really close to the same because you're taking a large sample. Well, what they found out is they did lots of this data where they took the Geiger counter, they, they ran it for a while till it had a lot of counts, you know, let's say 10,000 counts or something, 20,000 counts, that'd be a good number. So it had 20,000 counts, and then they took that data put it away, did it again, took that data, put it away. This is sort of like the double slit experiment where they put the stuff in the envelope. Okay, they put these in envelopes and then they sorted the envelopes and they said, okay, in this bunch of envelopes, we want you guys with your focused intent to make the right, the right Geiger counter have more counts than the left Geiger counter or vice versa in another group. And then they, of course, they'd have their control groups and so on and what they found out is the exact same thing with the hospital stays the people could modify that. So that right Geiger counter now had some more counts in it. Well, now it's not that unusual that one would have more or less because you know they're not gonna have exactly the same. But statistics can tell you how much different they're going to be, right? So let's say the normal uncertainty out of that 10,000 is that one of them normally would have uh, three, or three or four more counts than the other. Just typically, that's how much difference you'd expect. But that right one was the one that had the more counts. And then they did it again, and the right one was the one that had more counts. And they did it again. You see, it should be some of the time it should have been the left one, half the time it should have been the left one, half the time it should have been the right one. But always when they used their focus intent, it was the right one that had the more counts. Or if they did it the other way, it was the left one that had the more counts. You see? So they could bias it by using intent with this Geiger counter. They've done the same thing with random number generators, ran pages and pages of random numbers, done the same thing, broke them up randomly, had different groups, and they can be biased. Now here's what's, here's, here's what's interesting about it. The bias would only be within the natural uncertainty. So let's say three or four counts was the natural difference you'd expect. All right, they could only bias it by that three or four counts. But the fact that they could bias 20 of them in a row, so there was always the right Geiger counter that got the more counts. That's like flipping a coin 20 times and getting heads every time, you see? Now that's one in a million. So what they were doing was one in a million even though any one of them wasn't that amazing, wasn't that outstanding. So this, this reverse causality 
thing has happened a lot. And the reason that's reverse causality is because here you have the Geiger counter and it's done. The counts have been measured, the data's been taken, it's been sealed in the envelope, and then a year later, these people use their intent and they can make all the counts that came in the right Geiger counter or the left Geiger counter, how higher or lower, depending on what they focus their intent on. And it's a one in a million that they can actually, you know, that, that, that would happen by chance. So that's, that's the way that works. Well, let's look and, and see what, what happens here. Um, let's do it with the patients since that was the first one. And we'll say there's, there's 20,000 patients altogether. And of those 20,000 patients, we're going to break that up into, uh, let's say, 20 groups of 1,000 patients. So now I have data. 20 groups, 1,000 patients each. Each group, I'm going to break into two groups of 500. One of those 500 is going to, so I have 20 experiments, if you will, and each experiment has a group just randomly separated into two groups of 500. Okay, now what the rabbis did is they'd pray for, you know, group, had group A and B. They'd pray for group A for having good health. And then they would have, group A would have good health here, and then if they, this next one, they'd pray for maybe B to have good health, and B would have better health. So they found that they could consistently do this to where their odds of, of doing it by chance were one in a million. Okay, now let's change that a little bit and say that, that, uh, that somebody did look at these hospital records and did do some statistical analysis on them. Let's say that they take this group of 500 and they'd look at the whole group, or the two groups of 500 together were a group of 1,000. Let's say that they looked at that group of 1,000 and decided what was the average hospital stay for that group of 1,000. Then they, they randomly split them into two groups and had them pray for group A. Well, what does that mean? If group A got a shorter stay, shorter than the average, by 5%, what's that mean? It means group B had to get longer stays by 5% because we know what the average was of the whole. Right? We know all 1,000 of them had a certain average hospital stay. That still has to be true because that's data in the system. So that, that means that, that if one went down, the other one had to go up by the same amount so that we didn't have any inconsistency with the, with the, with the uh, data that the statisticians had done. Okay. Now that's an experiment that I don't think has been done, but you know, that's, to my way, of, you know, in, my, in my theory, that would be the way it would have to happen. One would have to go up as much as the other one goes down. So that's the way it works. And let's say before they had the whole thing, the whole group was, the statistics of the whole group of the 20,000 was, de was determined before they gave it to the rabbis and split it all up. At the end, no matter how they were balanced, the whole group together would still have to meet that criteria. You see, they'd still have that one constraint. The total ensemble would have to be the same that was calculated earlier. The reason that the rabbis can do this is that the statistical representation of this data is still in the future. Nobody's looked at this data. It hasn't happened yet. Okay, it's like those detectors in the, it's like the detector data and the uh, screen data in the double slit experiment. Nobody's looked at them yet. So the data, even though it's been taken, isn't really firm yet. It can change because it's in the future. Okay, so that's the way, that's the way this works. So in the, the data still in the future, an intent focused can change the result. Easy scientific experiment to do. Everybody has random number generator. Go generate 50 sheets of random numbers and do the experiment. It's not that hard. You can bias the results to within the uncertainty. So they couldn't make all of group A say get out of the hospital in an hour and the rest when the average is you know, a week. That's outside the natural uncertainty of the results. So you see how we have that working and why does it have to stay within the natural uncertainty? Because the psi uncertainty principle requires that. That way it's not, it doesn't break any rules. Otherwise it breaks some rules. See, it's the consistency that makes the difference. Okay, so this is, this is how that works. There is no backward causality. It's just that Things sometimes are still in the future, and we can change them 
before we take the measurement that brings them into the present. Okay, we have uh, lots of things that work the same way. You go to YouTube, there's a couple of things that you can find there. One of them is a, is a physicist called Bill Tiller, and Bill Tiller raises and lowers pH of water. He takes a beaker of water right out of the spigot, has a pH of 7. Uh, it's 7, is that right? Yeah, 7, it's neutral. Okay, it has a pH of 7, and they measure it, and it's around 7, like tap water is. He gets somebody with a focused intent to try to raise or lower the pH of the water. In a few weeks, he can get a, he can get a pH up to a whole, you know, a whole number, you know, one pH going like, say, from 7 to 8, that's a big change, or 7 to 6, that's a big change. And he can get as much as one, one and a half. I think he's sometimes gotten two whole pH. They've gone from a seven to a nine, or a seven, or a seven to a five, just with intent. Okay, well, how does he do that? Of course, Bill Tiller doesn't know how he does that. He just knows that it, that it works. And he's done the, he's, he's watched and, you know, he's photographed it, he's had movies of it. He measures the pH every hour or something and he sees that it just slowly walks up. Well, the way that works, is the same as the patient's. The pH of water changes all the time. You've got little OH negatives and little H pluses breaking down from the water, recombining. Water is an active substance, right? It's going on like that all the time. Normally, there's as much gain as loss in the pH, but if you look at the pH of water, it's going to not be 7 like this. It's going to be, you know, here's 7 in the middle, right? It's going to average 7. But it's sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little lower. It just depends on how these things separate and recombine at any instant of time. So there's uncertainty in exactly what that pH is, but it's down in maybe the third decimal place or fourth decimal place. So if you had a sensitive enough instrument, it would be jumping around as to what it was showing. Well, what the person with his intent is doing is he's biasing that uncertainty to, let's say, raise the pH. So where that uncertainty is, it slides up a little just within the natural uncertainty of the pH of the water. And then he does it again, and now it rises up a little bit. And then he does it again, and he can rise it up a little bit. So over time, it just walks it up, and he can raise or lower that pH just because he's doing it by tiny increments that stay within the natural uncertainty of the pH of the water. So basically that bias is causing those H pluses and OH minuses to combine and recombine in a biased way. Well, that's how Bill Tiller does that. That uh, Dr. Uh, Masuro Emoto freezes ice crystals. When he freezes ice crystals, he, he uh, plays pretty music and the ice crystals are pretty. He plays ugly music and the ice crystals are ugly. He thinks pretty thoughts, says pretty words. He gets pretty ice crystals, ugly words, ugly thoughts. He gets ugly ice crystals. And of course, the, the conclusion from that is, is that water likes the music that he likes. And water, you know, thinks that, that uttering words like, like um, you know, Hitler and whatever else, you know, words that are, that are supposedly unfriendly, that the ice doesn't like those, doesn't like Hitler, so it gets ugly crystals. And of course, it's not like that. It's because Dr. Emoto likes classical music. He likes Bach. He doesn't like acid rock. So when he plays acid rock, the crystals are ugly. When he plays Beethoven, the crystals are pretty. The way water crystals freeze has a lot of uncertainty in it. Have you ever heard that no two snowflakes are the same? It's because when it freezes, there's billions of ways that water crystals can form. Lots of uncertainty. So if you have someone thinking, these are pretty words, this is nice music, you know, it's very positive. The positive gives a lot of symmetry to the ice crystals. When they think it's going to be ugly, it's ugly. So it's not that the ice likes Beethoven. It's that Dr. Emoto likes Beethoven. So you see that explains those bunch of experiments. Um, Pair Labs, Princeton uh, Laboratories, they do a lot of mind matter ex experiments. One of the ones they do that's most interesting is they have this robot. And the robot's programmed to go randomly in any of the four directions, up, back, you know, side to side. So what it does when they let this robot go, it just, just kind of dithers around in the middle of the table. They put it in the middle of a big circular table, and it can dither around for days. You know, it just will do that, and it won't leave because it's just as likely to, 
go this direction, it's that direction, so it never actually gets anywhere. Then they get a graduate student, they apply their, their intent to it, and over a few minutes that robot will dither itself, falls off the edge of the table. And that's because it's biasing those random numbers. It's biasing the random numbers to be just a little bit biased, just within the natural uncertainty of random numbers, and then now it's got a new set, just a little bit more, just a little bit more, and eventually it walks and drops it off the table. So all of these work in the same way. It's that consciousness modifies a future probability. We can change what happens in the future with our intent. That's how we heal. Okay, it's the, it works all the same thing. So the uh, yeah, information can be lost or destroyed, just like in that, uh, the erasure experiment. It would work the same way. If, if the uh, statisticians got those hospital reports, broke them all up into those groups, and then, and then uh, did, the, did the analysis of the, of the average hospital stays for all the groups of 500, right? There'd be 40 of those groups, two in each of the 20 experiments. Then the rabbis would work on it. They couldn't do a thing because the data already was here. We know what the answers were. You can't bias them anymore. The particle's already become an electron or a photon, you know? You can't change that anymore. But then if they did all that work and had the answer and then it all burned up, now you could bias it again. See, the data can come and the data can go. So, so here we're seeing real life, all these experiments from, you know, Emotos to, to the ones at Pair Labs to the, the uh, ones with the Geiger counters and a random number, all these experiments work exactly like a double slit experiment. You see, quantum mechanics applies to everything wherever there's uncertainty. Choice. Why do physicists think that it only applies to little things? Well, I should rephrase that. The double slit looks at the uncertainty in the position of things. It's uncertainty in the position. So the uncertainty is big enough that it can go through both slits. So we don't know really where it is. Well, when things are little, particularly little and fast, there's a lot of uncertainty about their position. Little things that you can't see, that are moving very quickly, a lot of uncertainty. So we say that quantum mechanics applies to little things because it's little things that have lots of uncertainty for us. It doesn't apply to big things like rocks because rocks don't have much uncertainty. So they're approximately objective. And photons and, and electrons are not approximately objective. That's why they do, that's why they have the results in the double slit that they have. It's because their position is unknown. So you see it all works the same way, whether it's the log falling over in the woods, whether it's a bunch of uh, random numbers in a, in a robot, whether it's the um, you know, ice crystals or the, the patients. If you have uncertainty, you can modify it and you have a, more, you have a probability distribution that has lots of different solutions. All right, so I guess we've been through all of that. Just one more point I wanted to make on this, this chart before I turn it over, and that's the very last bullet. I didn't mention, I didn't mention uh, that. And that is that uh, because the system's really working with a statistical model, and uh, because of low fidelity modeling, the system very occasionally gets stuck. You know, it's juggling things, right? It's doing this synchronicity. It's nudging a little here and nudging a little there. Sometimes if it backs itself into a corner, or a nudge here conflicts with something else it wants to do, well, the system can cheat. It doesn't like to cheat because that, de that deteriorates the consistency of the system. But it can if it has to, if it gets backed into a corner. What I'm saying is that the system doesn't have to be perfect. You see, the system can make mistakes and still recover. It's not a perfect system. So uh, it... Uh, it picks, the, it picks the cheat of minimum effect, and it still has to obey the psi uncertainty. But the system can, it's playing all sides, right? It's the, it's the computer. So it's like the, the administrator of the computer can go in and do a cheat to the game if they need to, but that ruins the, the play because it's no longer consistent. So it does that as little as possible, but it does happen sometimes. Weird things happen. Okay. Summary, just want to start off with a summary of where we are now. Uh, 
what we've learned up to this point is that physics and metaphysics becomes part of one logical theory and are thus unified. Uh, Eastern philosophy and theology have been integrated with science. Love and spirituality are both defined in terms of entropy, a measurable quality. Result is that uh, the normal and the paranormal are all the same. Paranormal is normal. There's nothing paranormal about it. You just need a bigger picture of what's normal. Um, we have derived a fundamental purpose of existence, and in general, our existence in particular, and to evolve toward lower entropy states. The result is that time, relativity, quantum mechanics have been derived from one overarching fundamental theory and just two assumptions. The measurement problem and the invariant velocity of light problem have been solved. That solves Einstein's little toe. Additionally, the appearance of backward causality, causality problem, the research at Pear Labs and others have all been solved and explained. So we've, we've done that so far. Um, additionally, um, we have shown that synchronicity is possible. Mind matter scientific anomalies have been explained, placebo effect, backwards causality, modifying random numbers. Lowering entropy increases the energy or power information available to evolving entity. That's why those who evolve actually have more power, and we're talking about personal power, not physical power. Okay, so you take somebody like uh, a Gandhi, or you take a Martin Luther King, or you take, these people had power. They changed whole uh, civilizations, if you will. They changed whole uh, um, ways that their countries and that their culture, and even multiple countries across the globe, changed how they think about things. That's power to make changes, that's real power. But these are all people, you know, Mother Teresa, these are all people that are very low, low entropy. People have a lot of power to change things. Now the change that is physical, yes, you can get, a, you can get some homicidal maniac who can change things for people, but that's really very minor compared to what you can, what you can change with a low entropy consciousness. Uh, love is defined as a fundamental expression of low entropy. We've discovered the larger consciousness system is an aware, evolving system, and that it, it's real and therefore finite. Now, a lot of people trip over that. Any real system has to be finite. Most of us that are not in a technical field or not in mathematics or physics or engineering, they use the word finite as a metaphor for bigger than you can imagine. And that's fine, there's no problem with that. If you think that, that infinite, I mean infinite, is bigger than you can imagine, if you think that's the definition of infinite, then you can call this system infinite. It is bigger than you can imagine. But in a more technical sense, it cannot be infinite because infinite doesn't exist. Infinite is just a concept. You can only approach infinity because if you had a system that was infinite and you added something to it, well, it would be bigger. That means it really wasn't infinite. So an infinite system can't be changed, can't be added to, can't be made bigger, can't grow. You see, an infinite system requires infinite energy and infinite you know, everything. It's, it's uh, not practical. Real systems have to be finite. Now it can be very, very big. It can be bigger than you can imagine. If you're, sitting in a, if you're floating in, a, in an inner tube in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the ocean looks infinite. Everywhere you look, for days and days and days, it always looks the same in any direction. It would seem infinite, but it's not really. The larger consciousness system is not really infinite either. It's just very, very big. If it's not infinite, then what does that mean? It means it has boundaries, right? There's a place where it stops. It's only but so big. Okay, well remember, this is in a, we're talking about a, a, a computer, if you will. We're talking about a, a, an information system. Not infinite, just large. What might be on the other side? Don't know. That's the limits of our knowledge. It's out of our, it's out of our ballpark as a, an intestinal bacterium to see that, to figure that out. But we can't uh, just make an assumption that it's infinite because we don't know. So you just leave it open. Um, let's see, what else? Um, we are all individuated units of consciousness, chips off the old block. We're one with all that is. We are all netted together. We all share information. 
you meet people sometimes and you just like them or you just don't like them. And we say, well, I get bad vibes from that person. Well, that bad vibes is just a metaphor for the data exchange that's going on between us all the time. All of us are exchanging data. We're all connected. Things that you do affect things that other people do. Now, the effect may not be large, but it is, it is there. We're all integrated at one. Um, what's the difference between physical and non-physical reality frames? Nothing. We say this reality frame that we're in, this universe is physical, and everything else is non-physical. That's because we're here. When you're dreaming, that dream reality seems physical, and this reality doesn't exist. It's non-physical. Whatever reality you're in, that's the one that seems physical. So there is no difference. There is no such thing as physical and non-physical. It's all in the pers perspective of the observer. So a reality is a physical reality because you're in it and it seems physical. If you're not in it, it's non-physical. So there is no difference. That takes us up, I won't get into detail, but that really takes us up to the next level of relativity. Relativity said that there was no fundamental inertial frame, that all inertial frames are the same. They just depend on the observer. And that's the same way here. All reality frames are virtual and they're all basically the same fundamentally as far as the reality frames go. They're all fundamentally the same. They're all finite, virtual realities. And whether they seem physical or not is whether or not you happen to be in them, experiencing them. Okay. Okay, there is consciousness with a big C, and then there's consciousness with a little c. I put this chart up because there's confusion as to what we mean by consciousness. From a little picture perspective, we talk about our consciousness, which is just us, our awareness. Okay, now that's what I'm calling little c consciousness. That's the view that's seen by the free will awareness unit. And a lot of this is just defining terms, so we can talk about these things. We need to have common vocabulary. Okay, so you are a piece of consciousness. You are a piece of big C consciousness. And your free will awareness unit is a chunk of big C consciousness. It's a piece of the larger consciousness system. But what's your free will awareness unit? That's the part of your consciousness that's now constrained by the rule set of this virtual reality game. That's like a piece of consciousness constrained to abide by the rules in this virtual reality game. What it sees and experiences, even though it is a piece of big C consciousness, what it sees and experiences is your little C consciousness. In other words, it's your local a consciousness in this local virtual reality. That's what little C consciousness is. So those are two different things. Um, your personal consciousness is a subset of the, local, of the larger consciousness system constrained in a virtual reality by one, the consequences of the rule set, and evolution that defines the virtual reality. Two, by the quality of the hosting individuated unit of consciousness. In other words, your consciousness here is dependent also on what you come in with. This evolution game is cumulative. It's the way evolution is. It's cumulative. You build. The next lifetime builds on this lifetime, and the one after that builds on both of them. You see, you're constantly growing improving your quality, and when you come back again to improve it a little more, you start with where you left off. Now, you still have to own it again. You're still starting from scratch, but a lot of things are just intuitively obvious to you. A lot of things just are easy. You go very quickly until you catch up quickly to where you were, and then you go on from there. So that's the way that works. So it's the quality you come in with. It's what the rule set gives you. And uh, it's what you do while you're here, how you change yourself by your uh, choices. Okay, now little c consciousness is caused by the data generated by big C consciousness being interpreted by a subset of that big C consciousness called the free will awareness unit. Okay, that's just what I, it's a summary of what I just said. All right, now we're going to talk about consciousness and brains. This is a thing that, affect, that a lot of people trip over, okay? And uh, let's see, we'll define terms on the next slide. Okay. The, 
The basics. Consciousness is fundamental. The physical reality is virtual. Okay. Under that, the physical, the PMR, is, by the way, is physical matter reality. It's this physical universe is what the PMR stands for. So the physical universe rule set evolved providing for the evolution of critters with brains. I mean, here we are, we're, we're critters with brains because that's what evolved in this big digital simulation where things like us, they evolved that way. All right, and that's the physical is derived by sending data to a subset of consciousness, that's us, creates the perception of a physical universe. So we get the data, we perceive it as this physical reality. Okay, how do we learn to do that? How do we get so clever as to get this data and interpret it as this physical reality? We learned that as an infant when we were born. When we were born, we didn't know how to interpret any data. We just got data, had no idea what it meant. But then we eventually figure it out. You know, we're lying there in our, in our crib or something and we see this thing go by. We don't know that that was our hand. That thing's attached to me, you know, no way. You know, I don't have any control over it. So you learn by experience. You have no idea what any data means. And then you learn that that's my hand and that the hand is attached to me and that I can move that and this and that and the other and pretty soon you're interpreting the data that you get to be this reality. That's how you get so clever as to be able to interpret this information like this. Okay, um, so the virtual brain, our brain, it's part of our body, right? It's a part of our physical system. It's only a virtual brain. It's creation of consciousness, big C consciousness, to impose the constraints of the rules set upon the virtual reality interaction. The brain cannot create consciousness or consciousness. It doesn't create big C consciousness. It doesn't create little c consciousness. It doesn't create anything. The brain doesn't actually store any information. The brain doesn't really do any processing. All that's done in consciousness. What the brain does is provide a set of constraints of what our free will, free will awareness unit, what our little piece of consciousness can do, think, feel, smell, it's, the, it's a constraint. And it's, con, it, it's a proper constraint because that brain, that virtual brain evolved to be the way it is in this virtual reality, you see? So we can have a different uh, interpretation here of the uh, brain consciousness body interface. Now there's a metaphor that describes brain as an information link. Sometimes people have the idea, okay, I have this brain and it's like a, a, a transducer, an information link to the consciousness system. And that's how I get information, you know, down into my brain. But that's not, that's not correct. It's a decent metaphor if you're not getting too much detail. But it's just not right. Remember uh, the smiley face with the sticks to separate it? You see, that's you as separate. I'm down here on the end of my, on my stick. And it's up there and I need a communication path to get between us. You see, that's part of that same... Um, virtual reality thinking that makes you feel that way. 